You're listening to the Just Press Pause Podcast with Andrew Kozak. I am super excited about today's episode. This is the Just Press Pause Podcast. I'm Andrew Kozak. Thank you so much for listening or for watching if you're watching on YouTube. If you are watching, don't forget to hit the subscribe button there on the bottom of the video. So I am dedicating this entire podcast to Romper Room. If you don't know what Romper Room is, here is a quick history. Almost every local affiliate in the 1950s and 60s produced a localized version of Romper Room. Always featured a teacher and then an ever-rotating change of local kids that would come on and learn exercises, the alphabet, do arts and crafts, and it was broadcast usually once a week. Now, the landscape of television by the 1980s pretty much changed, so they basically just syndicated it out of Baltimore. Did about 100 episodes there in the early 80s and then moved it to its final place up in WWOR Studios in Secaucus, New Jersey. The production of that lasted until the late 80s and then it went into syndication till the mid-90s and then it was done. Now, I grew up watching Miss, Miss Molly and she was the one that was the teacher at WWOR Studios. She actually started in Baltimore. I love the show. I learned so much on the show and I was able to get on the show myself in the late 1980s when it was actually in its final round of episodes. So today, Miss Molly, the former hostess of Romper Room, is going to be joining me on the podcast to talk about all things, of course, behind the scenes, how it was being a hostess, how she got to that position, and if there's any future for anything Romper Room related as we move into this new virtual learning during the current coronavirus pandemic. Now, I also chose for my water cooler weather to talk about advection because it's something that I first remember learning on Romper Room. You might say, hold on a second. They didn't actually try to explain advection to a bunch of three, four, five, six-year-olds, right? Well, not really. What they did or what Miss Molly did was explain about cold air and warm air moving and why you shouldn't keep the doors or windows open when you have air conditioning or heat on in the summer or the winter. So I actually remembered that. And that was actually only a couple of shows before I went on. So today, our water cooler weather that will begin right now is all about warm and cold advection. You might have heard the meteorologists sometimes talk about advection on TV, but first we'll start with the word itself, which means transport. Cold air advection describes transporting cold air by the wind, while warm air advection, well, you guessed it, transports warm air by the wind. Now, cold air advection can usually be found behind a cold front where the air can actually cool down 10, 20, even 30 degrees. Warm air advection, on the other hand, well, that's found usually ahead of a warm front. Now, that oftentimes will increase temperature significantly ahead of a system. Now, here's the important part. With warm air advection, you're introducing uplift since warm air is less dense than cold air and rising of that air which usually signals more active weather, including rain, clouds, and yes, even thunderstorms, even severe thunderstorms, and even tornadoes. Now, with cold air advection, it's basically the reverse. Colder air is more dense than warm air, so that will signal a downward surge in the air that's moving. Now, downward or sinking air, well, that oftentimes helps clear things out, dry things up, a phrase I like to say a lot, which is why behind a cold front, it'll be colder, often drier, and many times even sunny, the next day. So cold air advection a lot of times may really cool you down, but it's also going to signal some quiet weather. There is your water cooler weather term of the day. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, there'll be illustrations and sometimes with these water cooler weather segments, some video to help explain as well. All right, without further ado, let's get the guest on. Good morning, Hopper Room friends. How are you today? You're feeling all right at your house today? Well, good. Everybody at home looks good. How's everybody here today? And let's see, what else are we going to do today? One second, hold on a second, Dan. Let me tell you what we're going to do. That was the last exchange between my guest today and myself back all the way in the late 80s. And I am so, so excited to have her joining me on Just Press Pause. Please welcome Miss Molly. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me, Andrew. It's it's really great to see you. You, you are too. a grown-up version of that little boy. <laughs> uh, my, I was gonna say or make a joke about my haircut, but you know, with this quarantine and all the hair salons being closed, I may be on my way to that pretty soon. It's, a lot of people are working on that. In fact, in fact, mine. I was supposed to get mine cut right before all this happened, and I had to change the appointment. 
Ooh. And I was due, but I'll wait. Well, and listen, it's better safe, right? And we'll just all look shaggy. And um, listen, I, I, I got to tell you, I was so excited not only to talk to you today about Romper Room, but also about the impact that you had on my life, the show had on my life, and the introduction to weather, because I just finished talking about water cooler weather and warm and cold air advection, and it was your show that I actually remember you, maybe not using the word advection to the kids, but talking about the flow of cold air, air conditioning and heat in the winter and summer. Uh, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> that is incredible. And what's really funny is I love weather. Uh, my kids always have always made fun of me because anytime there was a storm, I was I was glued and I was telling them, look, you see where the low here is and it's down in down around Texas. It's going to make its way up the East Coast and get to us. And we're going to have this big snowstorm. And they're like, Mom, how did you always know? And I but I thought that I wanted to be a weather person uh, back when I was growing up. They were called weather ladies, the weather girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told my parents that that's what I wanted to do. And my dad had said to me, but I thought you wanted to be an actress. And I went, oh, I'm not good enough to be an actress. And well, the rest is history. I did, but I've always loved weather. I've always had a thing about weather. Well, you know, you were ahead of your time with the show because, and I, I know for anybody that's not familiar, Romper Room started way before I was ever on it, way before it was Romper Room and Friends. It was just Romper Room. I was going through the list of local markets that actually had the show and it was incredible. There was a Cleveland and Albuquerque, uh, uh, you know, Iowa had one, uh, but you were so it's ahead of your- I grew up. That's right. I watched Jamie growing up. Yeah. I mean, there were so many Miss Sally's, Miss, you know, and- when you got on the show in the early 80s, you started with Baltimore and it became Romper Room and Friends. Why did they change the name? I, I'm not sure why they changed the name. I think they changed the name because they wanted to change the format of the show. They added the characters of Granny Cat, Kimball, and Up Up. So they'd always had Doobie and they'd always had Paddington Bear. And they wanted to bring it more into add more music. I was the first, I believe, the first romper room teacher who sang, because at my audition I had to I had to sing. They they at the audition asked me to work a puppet, so I learned how to do the puppet of Granny Cat. Granny Cat was me. In fact, she's here in the house downstairs. Wow, <laughs> that brings back <laughs> memories. Yeah. Uh, so I think that they just wanted to change the, the format of it and, and add music and puppets. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I was the first teacher who was not actually a teacher. I was trained as an actress. So was that your first gig or you had you had that other was, previous credits? That was my, well, I'd, I'd been in a couple movies. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in, if you look at the opening scene of Dawn of the Dead, George Romero was... George Romero's Dawn of the Dead, uh, the opening scene, the 1970s movie of the, I'm walking into the control room, my turn for the coat, that's 19 year old Molly. And then after that, I was in a movie called Night Riders, which was George Romero's first not horror film. Mm -hmm. And it was Ed Harris's first movie. He played the king in that movie. And I was the corn cooks woman that's why I got the romper room job. I was in New York for the opening of Night Riders when I heard about the romper room audition, and uh, I was, you know, moving to New York to be an actress. And I'd gone on two auditions. The first one was for the movie Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. <laughs> Didn't get that part. I was too wholesome. A Tommy total, too total different uh, vibe from the romper room. <laughs> <laughs> it was too wholesome. The second audition was romper room. I was so blessed. I think. At the time, I really didn't realize how blessed I was to have that job. It really is incredible how, it, you know, it, it was something that we grew up with. I'm going to quickly pause for a second and uh, show everybody at, that's watching right now on the YouTube channel a clip from the one that I have because I'm so happy I was able to find it and digitize it. If you're listening to this uh, audio only, you can hear some of that. Maybe next time you're out in the garden and you're digging around the soil with the grown-up, you can see if you can find all the different parts of soil. Right hand over your heart, look at the flag and say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. R-O-M-P-E-R, R-O-O-M. And what does garden begin with? G-A-R-D. 
E N. Oscar Lord is on his pick to keep the key. We had a rundown. I would have a rundown of what we were going to do, what we were going to open with, what, you know, whatever tapes I was going to throw to, commercials I would throw to, what games we were going to play. All of that was sent to me by the producers in Baltimore, who was Miss Sally. So this was started in the 1950s by Nancy Claster and her husband, Bert Claster. And they then, the next National Romp Room teacher was Miss Sally. And she's the one who hired me and trained me. So they would send uh, scripts every week, which, you know, sometimes I followed them. Sometimes I didn't. Sometimes I, you know, we would change things on the fly and say, oh, and we're not doing this. It would depend on the kids. Uh, I would interview the local uh, guests that were going to come to the show if we had any guests on the show. But once, once we started, you know, well, the first two years, it was live. It oh, was wow. not live tape it was live i'm so, so glad mine wasn't <laughs> it was that was that was always very special uh mm -hmm. if there was going to be an animal it was going to do its thing on the air it, it was just a given uh so we never knew what kind of things were going to happen when it was when it was live it was interesting when it was an hour it was an hour live and then we went to live on tape you know here's what i love about growing up in the era that I did to have that show is because I would watch it all the time. It was so, you know, seeing all the characters, Kimball, Granny Cat, Up Up, and then having it accessible to be on the show itself. You just don't see that anymore these days. Well, actually, now there is that potential because now we've got this option to bring people in virtually mm -hmm. where we are. I'm watching a lot of people on on Instagram, bringing people into their Instagram. So I'm thinking about there might be an option now more than there was before to actually have kids on a program and they're not actually in the same room. You know, it's an interesting concept because to have them, you know, the par parents that have to homeschool right now, I mean, you have to give them credit because people, especially those that are working, have to juggle so much right now. And it's so important that the kids are continuing to be stimulated and continue to learn. Uh, but to have something like that, it's, it's, I think my, right now would be a good time because everything is virtual. It's, it's, it's possible. And it, it actually could make it easier because think about what all of the parents had to go through to bring their kids into the studio. Yeah. I remember I would always talk to the people about how to get there. Now, when we first went on the air, the station was in Times Square, and it was it was oh, brought in 42nd and 43rd, pre, it wasn't anything like Times Square is today. Mm -hmm. I mean, back then... You didn't want to take a, kids. <laughs> there was a porn theater next door. Yeah. And I used to have to tell the parents, don't walk up 42nd Street. If you get off at Port Authority, you've got to walk your kids up 43rd Street, mm -hmm. and then as soon as you see the station turn right immediately do not go to the next door yeah you know the same year my parents brought me to romper room they took me to the city to see phantom of the opera mm -hmm. uh and that was my first one of my first experiences my first memory in the city and i remember the lights i just remember being whisked back into the cab or into the car <laughs> you know you, you didn't spend a lot of time outside that theater that's right yeah so what do, what year did you guys move to secaucus we moved to secaucus i I want to say, let's see, we got married in 84 and we were still in Manhattan then. I think it was 1986 that it moved to Secaucus. And because it was shortly after I had moved, I'd lived in Manhattan and then I moved to, when, when we got married, we moved to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And it was still pretty decent, it was fine to commute to the station from Brooklyn. But then they moved it to Secaucus and it became a uh, yeah. a much longer commute for me. And that's when my husband and I moved to New Jersey. Yeah. So now I'm looking at, you know, the IMDB and all that other stuff. I remember, so I was, I was on the show in 1987 and the very end, and I'll, I'll show a clip at the end of this. My little brother was two years old and you had him next to you with the magic mirror. Magic so mirror I was looking back at, at what year it was. Uh, it was played 
into the early 90s, right? I mean, syndicated yes. and then stopped. We went out of production. In fact, the day that I was coming to the station to let them know that I was expecting our oldest child, Charlie, was the same day they told me they were canceling the show. Oh, wow. Uh, the, the program director came to me and he said, I, I need to talk to you. And I said, oh, I need to talk to you, too. <laughs> And uh, we went, I went into his office and he said, you first. And I went, no, you go first. <laughs> and he had told me that they were, they were, you know, not going to do the production of Romper Room anymore and that, that it was going out of production, but they were going to continue playing until, you know, keep playing the syndicated. They started playing the syndicated version at Channel 9. And it ran, I don't know how long it ran on Channel 9 in syndication, but nationally it ran in syndication until 1994. Wow. But we went out of production in 1987. So you were on one of the very last. Yeah. I don't know whether if you remember when it was, but it was somewhere around July of 97. It, I believe, I'm pretty sure it was the, yeah, su okay. the summertime. Yeah, yeah. I, I might have been on one of the last ones. You might have been on one of the very last ones. So I told some friends of mine that I'm talking to you, especially the ones that were actually on the show and had met you all those years before. And I was looking for them on my episode to see if I was like, hey, did we, were we maybe on the same <laughs> one? It could have been. Uh, some of the kids, here's the question that, that the number one question I had is from, from friends of mine. Some of the kids were like regulars, right? And then some of them okay. weren't or kind of, yeah. <laughs> The people, in order for the children to get on Romper Room, their parents would send a letter to us when the child was born. There was a four-year waiting list. Oh, wow. To get on to the show as, to be on for a week. And there was not a great deal of diversity in the children that were in that pool. And the other option was for people to call and say they want to be a guest for a day, which I'm guessing is what you were. You were on for one day? Yeah. Okay, so the guests, there was also a rather long list for that as well. Again, not a great diverse population. And I wanted to be sure that the population that was out there watching was represented on the show. So whenever uh, kids came in who, uh, you know, were cooperative, were fun, and also showed another population other than the blonde haired, blue eyed kids that was the majority of the kids. Mm -hmm. I would call them, and I actually became very good friends with a lot of those, a lot wow. of the kids. And some of them, I would, I, I think of some of the names of some of these recurring kids that I would love to see again, mm -hmm. but I don't, you know, I don't know how to find them. I don't know where they are. Or well, whatever. we're going to tag, we're going to tag the heck out of this video, and hopefully they'll find, they'll find you. Because, uh, I mean, you, you did, you had a, you know, look, I think it was probably right after the group of kids that were watching it my age is when you had like the Barney's, you know, I mean, you always had Sesame street, but you had like the Barney and now of course now it's and blues clues, blues clues, which has made another my, comeback. My children watched all of that. And I've, I've sometimes people who are younger who didn't watch romper room and said, you know, well, what was it? And I'd say, well, it was kind of like Barney, only I didn't have the suit. It was me. Right. Well, you know, and the thing, the thing I think what, what was so memorable too, was, you know, you had the exercises, the games and things like that. But I specifically remember, you know, like Up Up, a, a uh, obviously one of the puppets that characters on the show for anybody that may not have seen. Oh, she's going to read. <laughs> yeah. For anybody that's watching out. There you go. There you go. <laughs> There's Up Up right there. And you had a clip of him in a burned out section of a forest. And he was explaining control burns in such a way that children... Oh can remember that. Like, I still remember that. I don't need to see a clip of it. Yeah, I, I remember. It. And that's what, because I thought it was such an odd thing because he summed it up by saying, sometimes forest fires are put there on purpose and it's a good thing, a control burn. And then you went into a segment and you were talking about mulch. And so it was just so ahead of its time because you just don't see that much I don't want to say effort because there's a lot of hardworking people on children's shows today, but yeah. you don't see that detail sometimes put in to make sure that kids can remember something, you know, as crazy as, hey, forest fires sometimes are controlled and they're done and there's a purpose for it. Well, they had, a, a, you know, of course, an educational consultants. There was a long list of educational consultants. And with that forest fire, Smokey the Bear used to come on all the time. He was a, a regular guest oh, wow. on the program. 
and uh, whoever, you know, whoever represented the forestry system, they were the ones who came. So they would have created that content for us to make sure that we had the correct content. And yes, all of the Granny Cat Kimball up up segments were all scripted. They, they were all scripted and several of them were done in the syndicated version. And often I would go, we would do Granny Cat live underneath the, the stairs there. Mm -hmm. And that used to always, you know, the kids would be like, what, wait a minute, you're, I'd say, yes, this is a secret. This is a, a secret that, oh, wow. that you know, because you're here that Miss Molly is really Granny Cat and you know, they always thought that was wild. Same with the the magic mirror secret that that anybody who was there, you learned that secret. Yes, I don't know you remember it. I don't remember it know. that from that from then. Actual but. two mirrors. Thanks for listening to part one of my interview with Miss Molly. Watch for part two next, where Miss Molly discusses life after romper room. What's next? How we just might be in prime position for a return to a social distancing digital revival, and she answers a few rapid fire questions. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel on YouTube and on your favorite podcast apps. Stay tuned for part two. Thanks for listening.